So here's a warning. And thank you for sticking around this long. This is a scriptural warning. And as you can see on the screen, it says, sugar-coated preaching is dangerous to your soul. It's better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals than falsehood that kills, that, that falsehood that comforts and then kills. It's very serious here. And that's why a lot of the times I know people, I can tell people in the world, they don't like hardcore teaching, you know, telling them that, you know, they're living in sins and they shouldn't be eating this and they shouldn't be watching that and they should be doing these things. And nobody wants to hear that all the time, especially when you love the world, right? So you're never going to find, you know, those who teach those kind of truths. They're never going to have big congregations. It just won't work that way. And it never was that way. Even in the time of the Messiah, there was very few. And even though multitudes and multitudes did follow him, they were just a remnant, a, a small few. Like think about it, Noah, in times of Noah, eight people saved. The destruction of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah and three other cities. Four people were saved, but one looked back and still lost her life. You know, Lot's wife, remember Lot's wife, she looked back at the world. So if you look at all the things and being known as a remnant, a little flock, where two or three are gathered, I hope it gives you an understanding that you're never going to find the big flocks around truth. Now, if you teach falsehood, and if you teach feel-good, you know, motivational, inspirational spirits that rev up people's minds and get them going to conquer the world and, you know, be their best them. Yeah, those churches are full. And they usually teach the prosperity doctrine. So be careful. Let's move on. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of Jah, of Elohim. Hmm. So, this year I've heard a lot being taught, and you know, there's some things about it that I think that, all right, you know, I believe that you can see certain, you know, scriptures, you can use scriptures for different things sometimes, and it won't really too much take away from the context. But at the same time, there is an approach to scriptures that has to be utilized putting line upon line, precept there, precept there, to get the full, deep meaning of what's going on. And so I spent the last uh, probably 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes, speaking about prosperity and, and being careful about it. But this is an important area right here because a lot of people teach differently. Let's get right into it. Matthew 5, verse 3. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Now, I gotta say this. The multitudes are also his disciples. The apostles are the twelve. Now, the apostles also are called disciples. But when you see here that the multitudes came unto him and the disciples came, those that were believers in him came. And he called them his disciples. And this, this has happened quite a, quite a few times in Scripture where there's crowds of people and he called them his disciples. So this is not just to the twelve. They're there as well, but pay attention to the message for everyone. It reads, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now I want to stop right here for a quick sec. And I'm finding that usually when I get into searching out when people talk about this topic, they'll tend to, um, let me put it here, they'll, they'll tend to associate this word meek here in verse 5. And kind of like use that as being poor in spirit. And poor in spirit and, and meek, two different things. But usually when people are teaching about the poor in spirit, they are, usually they're describing what meekness is. And I think that, that that has to be distinguished. So let's continue. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So make sure you, you know, you're seeking, you're thirsting for righteousness and you're not thirsting for success in the world. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall, she, shall see Jah. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of Jah. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say, shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Yeah, you're blessed if they start calling you evil. I've been there before. I've been called evil many times. <laughs> That's just how it goes, right? Rejoice and be glad and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Wow. So you see what happens, right? And this goes on. If you even read it more, I'm not going to cover all of this read, but it says that the false prophets were treated great by society. They loved them. They bigged them up. They spoke well of them, just like how they do today. It's the same thing. People love their pastors and their preachers. And, you know, people usually join churches and this kind of idea, usually because of the pastor and the preacher. And I mean, I get it. You know, you want somebody to speak to you, but usually they, they like the the fieriness, the eloquence. And usually the, the best speakers I find in the world have been trapped up into, you know, deception. And so they, they teach a lot of good things, but then they mix a lot of poison in it. And that's where there's a problem, right? You got to make sure that you, you look at yourself. If you just put a little bit of, of poison in, in the drink, you're going to die or in the food. And that's what's happening with everyone. They're, they're, the devil's using the Bible. <laughs> and good people have to use the scriptures too. The wheat and the tares, right? So you got to have your head on your shoulders, everyone. Let's continue. Now, I'm talking about this word meek, right? And uh, if, you, if you look at it, this word meek right here, it's from the Greek um, translation here. And this is Greek 4239, as you can see on the screen. And that word meek that we just read, it means mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit, meekness. And I want to read the definition underneath it as well, because I think it's, it, it's appropriate. Meekness toward the Most High is that disposition of spirit in a person in which we accept his dealings with us as good. And therefore, without disputing or resisting. So if you're meek, you're happy with how the Most High has dealt with you. And you're not going to resist it, even if there's sometimes things that go wrong. In the Old Testament, the meek are those wholly relying on the Most High, rather than their own strength to defend against injustice. Now this is where this, um, this definition of meek starts to have a, a great play. You, you you don't fight when you're being treated bad. You don't fight. It's like how if you read the Apocrypha and you have the woman with her seven sons and, you know, there, there's not a fight there. You just, it's almost like you're sacrificing, you're taking it, even though you're treated wrong. Let's continue with this definition. Thus, meekness toward evil people means knowing the Most High is permitting the injuries that they inflict on you, that he is using them to purify his elect and that he will deliver his elect in his time. Gentleness or meekness is the opposite to self-assertiveness and self-interest. It stems from trust in the Most High's goodness and control over the situation. So again, here I just got to point out, it's, it's not about you asserting yourself, you know, getting revenge. You're being treated wrongly and, and you take it. And I have to say, you know, um, my late uncle who passed away, David Ray, you know, he's a very meek person. And, and sometimes I even look at the things he went through in life and he was one to just take it. And um, it doesn't mean that he was happy about it, but he wasn't one of vengeance. And I learned that from him. And it's something that I never really learned and saw is like until I, you know, late in life for him. So this is something, you know, we want to hold on to. We don't want to... T take you know take take the hurt sometimes that way and i don't mean be a softy and be overwhelmed and just let people walk over you just don't think about being vengeful let's continue the last sentence reads um 
The gentle person is not occupied with self at all. And this is a work of the Holy Spirit, not the human will. And then I also looked up in the dictionary, just another kind of a, a definition. It says, when meek is used in a positive way, meek describes someone who shows patient restraint. When used negatively, it means overly submissive. The positive sense of meek implies that someone is able to remain calm and subdued even when being provoked. So that's what I want to get at. When people usually talk about blessed are the poor in spirit, they usually have it in this type of area that that person is kind of meek or they're, you know, they're, they're weak in themselves. And I'm going to talk about it more as we move along, but there's a difference here. So let's look at another definition in a second here. And again, you know, when we look at this situation here, we all, you know, feel weak in our lives. We feel lowly, you know, we, we feel like we're empty. We don't have enough to give the most high. You know, we wish we had more spirit and strength within us, so to speak. We would say that, you know, that we, we can put more better, stronger efforts to the most high. But, you know, that, that sounds good. And, and that is true. But this blessed is the poor in spirit. He's not fully kind of talking about that. And think about it, if you're poor in the Most High's Holy Spirit, how is that blessed? And I guess you could say, well, if you are poor in your own spirit, in your own strength, and, you know, woe is me, I don't know what I can do. I'm so poor, I can't give the Most High nothing. Okay, I see that. But that's not fully what the scripture means when you put line upon line. So yeah, be humble, be meek, so to speak. But that's not what poor in spirit means right, right off the bat. I know that a lot of people teach that, you know, and, you know, where do you turn to? There's no one else to turn to in life and you're all alone, so to speak, trying to find your way. And, and I get that. And um, again, we, this might be in the area of mourning, being lonely, being meek, not in the area though of being poor in spirit. And we, we will talk why in a bit. And, and I'm talking to you. And I want you to get this message. <laughs> really, I want you to get this message. You see, look in this kid's eyes here, right here. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I hope you're hearing this message because now we have to really get into it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's go and begin at Luke 4, the beginning of the Messiah's ministry. To put this all together. Luke 4, 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of Jah, the Lord, the Most High, is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. And recovering of the sight of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Most High. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. So we can see here that the Messiah was, was quoting from Isaiah. And I, I want to get the read in Isaiah because I think this is where people get the the miscue of meek and poor, uh, I get the confusion of meek and poor. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, it reads, The spirit of Jah Elohim is upon me, because Jah hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to build up, bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So you can see here a little bit, oh... I can see where they would have kind of got this uh, understanding and thinking that the poor is also the meek. But even in this definition of the word meek, it's not the word, you know, it doesn't mean what we just read what meek means. And I'll show you that in a, in a second. So let's look at Luke chapter 7, verse 22. It reads, Then Joshua answering said unto them, John's disciples, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. 
how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. So we have this word poor, as you can see here in Luke 7, and we have the word poor in Luke 4, and we have the word meek from the Old Testament. So let's take a look at something here. This is the poor. Right? We're talking about here, when we're talking about blessed are the poor, we're talking about those who don't have the means to survive in life. The downtrodden of the earth. And guess what? The world and media does a good job of keeping the, if not billions, of poor people and oppressed people out of our sight. You now we see what's in our city. Every so once in a while, you can turn on, you know, a World Vision show and they'll show you parts of Africa and parts of Asia and Europe that are downtrodden and poor, like you see before you. But this is the poor, I believe, that the Most High is talking about but not just the regular poor. Think about this. Even if you're poor, you can still be disobedient or obedient. You can still be wicked or righteous, evil or good, right? And we, we see a lot, you know, I'm usually around poor people who are very wicked. That's how I grew up. We call it the ghetto, so to speak. And in the ghetto, as you know, there's nothing really good down there. It's just a bunch of hustlers, right? When we're talking about this poor here, and we're looking at this word that was defined in, um, in Luke, that poor, when it said, blessed are the poor. This is a, a Strong's translation, and it, you can see that up top it has the poor. And it also means poor, beggar, poor man, and beggarly. Reduced to beggary, begging, asking alms, destitute of wealth, influence, or position, or honor lowly afflicted, destitute of, this says here, the Christian virtues and eternal riches. So that's where people, right there is where they get that definition to think is like, it's talking about, you don't, you know, you're poor and you don't have the eternal riches. But again, we're going to see what's going on. And you can see most of this definition is talking about the poor. It goes on to say the poor and needy, lacking in anything as respects their spirit. Here it says, destitute of wealth, of learning and intellectual culture, which the schools afford, men of this class most readily give themselves up to the Messiah's teaching and prove themselves fitted to lay hold of the heavenly treasure. So all of that, those, that area there of, of speaking about this definition, it is, um, is what poor is. It's talking about, like I showed you, the poor people. Now remember when it said in Isaiah chapter 61, it said the meek though, right? So I went in there and I, I looked up, you know, after a bit when it's talking about, you know, this is poor again. This is a poor man here, right? The lowly. Now, if this man here in front of you is following scriptures and obedience and he has a Bible in his back pocket and he's doing the best he can and he relies and trusts on the Most High to help him get through every single day, that's, that's a poor man right there in spirit. And you might say, well, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't say blessed is the poor man that is in the spirit. But Old English has a funny way of putting things. But you see, this is what we're going to be getting to. That word meek, right? The same word meek that was in Isaiah chapter 61, where in Luke it said poor, and then it said meek. This is what it says here in that meek. It's the word anav. And it means, it says meek, humble, poor, lowly, very meek. So you see again, poor, humble, afflicted, meek, poor, needy, poor and weak. So you see like sometimes... When this word meek is used, it's not used in its right context. You know, um, poor people can be meek, but not all meek people are poor. Making sense? Right? You could have, you know, you could just not be poor and be a meek person. Again, I could talk about my, my uncle, you know. I wouldn't consider him the poorest of anything, but he was a meek person. But again, not all poor people are meek either. So we're talking about people who are, you know, are low on cash, so to speak. And I don't laugh at low cash. Just, this is what it's getting down to. People don't got money. And just because you're a little bit broke here in North America, all right, I get that. We can be poor too because, you know what? Being, being poor in North America, yes, sometimes you can go on the street and be on the streets and what you call homeless. 
but you can still have a home and still, you know, struggling to make things, you know, ends meet, so to speak, as they say, hand to mouth, you know, living is going on, that, that can happen. And you can still maybe have a roof over your head. And you might, you not, you might not necessarily live in like a, those garbage slums. So there's different areas of, of, of poor in the world, right? Um, that way to identify for yourself. When I think about poor as well, you know, I'm speaking about those who don't have those who are in need, not those who are lazy and sluggers. That's a, a completely different thing. Let's get an understanding here. And this is what I'm going to get it. Now, in Luke chapter 6 right here before you, you're going to see that it's the same um, beatitudes that was um, read before. But it's just in, you know, how the Gospels have, you know, they, sometimes they cover the same scenario. It says, verse 6, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of Jah. Now you see the difference right here? There's a big difference to me, right? He's saying, blessed be you poor. He's talking to those people who have come in before him. They're poor. He's feeding them. They're following him. He just Remember, we just read that he's, they're going to have the gospel, the good news, the message of the kingdom preached to them. You might say, well, why couldn't they have it preached to them before? Because the wicked people who are in high society, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the Herodians and the lawyers of Israel, they were blocking the kingdom of heaven. So even though they were teaching certain things, what is right and wrong to do, they weren't allowing them to get into the kingdom of heaven. And if you remember that scripture, it says full well, the Pharisees, you know, they're not going into the kingdom of heaven. And then they block others who are going to try to get in. But the Most High is saying, guess what? Even though you're poor, you're going to be blessed. You poor, the ones who are poor in spirit, the ones who love me and obey me, don't, don't worry about your, your, your struggle and your hard times which you're in. Because the Most High has got you. And that's what he's trying to say here. And if there's more verses to go on, we're just getting started, so to speak. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. So again, look at this, you know. Their hunger, you know, and we know they, they could be thirsting for righteousness. But those are also who are weeping now. You know, those who, like when it's talking about weeping and mourning and all these type of things, it's just look at life in general. Everybody wants to be happy and always have a smile on their face and be on the up and up. And I, I get that, but that's not the reality of how things are. Because if you just are just on the up and up and that's all you want, then when you're even mediocre or you go get a little bit lower, you start to fall apart, right? You get bent out of shape. But you have to know that if you're in this life and not everything's a party, not everything is all the fun stuff and we're able to travel the world and get all the greatest experiences and eat and drink because tomorrow we're going to die and live your best life now and love yourself and find yourself because, you know, you're going to soon die and all of that stuff I don't buy it right love the most high do you know that idolatry the number one idolatry is worshiping idols the number one idol that people worship is self don't you notice that all these movements the secret and all these new age movements love yourself find yourself clear your mind take yoga do all of these things but it doesn't they don't say love the most high first it's almost like we we want to put him second and give him you know you know, like put them on the back burner, so to speak. So just because life isn't great for you and those people who mourn and are struggling more times, they're going to get their time. And then those of us could be like us and who are just living it up and feeling good. In the end, we might be sorry. It only makes sense. Verse 22 reads, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. So your friends are going to be lost as well. That's right. Your worldly friends. You might have to find some new spiritual friends. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. So those of us who want to teach and be leaders, just know that, you know, 
it's not gonna doesn't mean it's always gonna be go, go well and people gonna say oh you, you you know you have such truth and knowledge and wow teach us no they're gonna hate you you're gonna say you're teaching folly how dare this guy come and try to tell us that we can't eat what we want and the messiah says very clear in the bible that what goes in doesn't defile us this is what happens right be strong now look at here what's going on but woe unto you that are rich for you have received your consolation consolation means you've received your prize and did you know that the word woe means calamity and destruction annihilation but woe unto you that are rich he's saying here this is amazing woe unto you that are full for you shall hunger woe unto you that laugh now for you shall mourn and weep so you see everything that i was saying before this is the words of the messiah so being in the the house of laughter and and, and mirth i think it's called it's better to be in the house of mourning even if it's for these short 70 years if you lived out long if you get blessed with 80 or 90 still short compared to eternity be strong and be careful how much fun you're really seeking in this world woe unto you when men when all men shall speak well of you for so did their fathers to the false prophets but i say unto you which hear love your enemies and do good to them which hate you bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you can you do these things a lot of people find these things hard to do but if you can follow these commandments of the messiah and really read about them study them and, and believe in them that that's how you're supposed to live praying for those who are enemies praying for those you know who don't like you i mean you don't have to go look out for people who don't like you and start mentioning their names you will know who it is but we pray for them that the most high may open up their eyes to truth and says bless them that curse you tough stuff but this is what it's going to be uh, this is what it takes to be what i call a messian as opposed to a christian a messian a follower of the messiah and a true believing israelite a true nazarene a true jazzelite and that <clears throat> let's continue so we're looking again blessed are the poor in spirit and as i said there are many more in the world who need it and i mean need have the needs for all these things that you know in in, in life to get by but at the same time the most high sees them they're not being overlooked by him at all Deuteronomy 15 so what it says for the poor shall never cease out of the land therefore i command thee saying thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother to thy poor and to thy needy in thy land you see that we're supposed to open up our hands wide I, I'm learning things as I'm talking to you my hands not open up wide you know now how wide should I open it as wide as Jah tells us to that's how wide we should be opening it and you notice it again it's to the poor and to the needy he raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are jaws and he had set the world upon them you see what i'm talking about here he's going to make those who are beggars they're going to be inheriting the throne of glory psalm 69 for jah heareth the poor and despises not his prisoners luke 6 we just read it and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said blessed be you poor for yours is the kingdom of heaven <clears throat> so you see that verse <clears throat> in first samuel chapter 2 it says to make them inherit the throne of glory and then in luke 6 the kingdom of jah it's the same thing proverbs 28 better is the poor that walks in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways though he be rich wow starting to say something right i mean i spent a lot of years trying to study how to be successful even online and be an entrepreneur and i kept coming across 
kept coming across the same thing, you know, about who you are and understanding you and bettering yourself. And I and I I do know it's important to better ourselves. But when it comes to this carnal, getting yourself better carnally and just learning how to maybe be smart, get a little bit more knowledge, that doesn't just cut it. You know, we have we have a lot more to move forward to and to strive for. We can't strive for these riches. So it's better for us to be poor at some sometimes, you know. You might look at the poor now as boy, you don't want to be like them, but they might be in better positions than you and I in the future. That's right. Remember it, right? Don't look at these things lightly, everyone. And I know there's wicked poor, so it's up to you to decide how you're going to handle things and, and handle the poor. And this is going to be our individual projects, you know. You might have some in your family that you know. You might have some that you might know in your assembly. You might have some neighbors that it might be like that. And I and I know you can go downtown and walk around and see a lot of poor, but then are those the poor in spirit? And, and if they are, how would you know? Because remember, it's blessed are the poor in spirit. We read all of those verses that said, you know, the poor person who was righteous. Makes you ponder and wonder. Luke chapter 6, again, continuing. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of Jah. And look at all these verses that I put on here and kind of compare them. These are the comparing line upon line verses, which make me understand that blessed are the poor in spirit means blessed is the poor people who live in spirit. John 4 verse 23 reads, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So you see here, you have to worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. Verse 24, Jah is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Are you getting it now? Isaiah 66, verse 2, for all those things hath mine hand made, and those things have been, saith Jah, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word contrite spirit in spirit blessed are the poor in spirit the most high is working for those to worship him in spirit and in truth praise his name romans 15 for it has pleased them of macedonia and achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which were at jerusalem the poor saints james 2 Verse 5, a very powerful verse. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not Jah chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? I hope this message is starting to get through. It's a very powerful message. As, as a matter of fact, when I was starting to do this study about the poor, I was overwhelmed. Couldn't get all the verses that the Messiah speaks about and, and the apostles and the prophets and the Psalms. Oh, so much. And this is why I believe that this is what the Most High is really talking about when it comes to being poor in spirit. Now, again, if you want to translate it to be poor in spirit, meaning your own human spirit and all of that, go ahead. Just don't overlook this this. Uh, this understanding as well. Blessed are the poor in spirit, everyone. Take a look, right? Those who are downtrodden, but those who still love the Most High, still pray to Him, still come to Him. Sad and when you think about things, how the world is this way. That everybody looks down upon the poor. Don't ever do that, you know. You just never know what's going on. 
These are going to be the people that are going to be shining bright like stars in the Most High's kingdom. And then those that are rich. Oh, oh it's very serious. We'll talk about them. Again. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Philippians 3. For we are the circumcision, which worship Jah, what? In the spirit. And rejoice in the Messiah, Joshua, and have no confidence in the flesh. Who are we? We are the ones who worship the Most High. How? In spirit. Romans 2, verse 29. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart or the mind. In the spirit, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of Jah. Romans 8, that the righteous of the law, righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but what? But after the spirit. <laughs> praise Jah. I really, this, this was a, I feel good about the most. I really believe for me. These are how I believe the Most High talks to me. He shares understandings of truths and then he builds upon them so that you can build your faith and be strong and put line upon line to discover his wonderful gems that he has. I'm very thankful to him. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. But to, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Wow. Because the carnal mind is enmity, hatred. It's an enemy against the Most High Jah. For it is not subject, what? To the law of Jah, neither indeed can be. So you see what it's about here. When you're walking in the spirit, you're walking in, the, in obedience to the Most High. In his commandments and when people try to tell you about oh there's 613 commandments and we can't do all this and or we should be doing all this and that and trust me none of them guys sat down there and counted all those commandments and a lot of those commandments probably one third of them don't even really regard it um the common man a lot of them are levitical commands special type of commands that were for israel in the land when they got there and all different types of things but people just try to make it seem like you know you can't walk and keep the, the law because it's 613 and, you know, you can't do it. <laughs> you got the 10 to guide you. The main thing, eh? The 10, Sabbath, the festivals of the Most High, eating clean meats and staying away from unclean meats. That's a great foundation. And then learn about the Messiah and anything that he says to do. Turn the cheek, pray for your enemies, whatever he tells you to do. Not lust, lust with your mind. Just do all of that too. <laughs> and then you'll be, you'll be good. But don't forsake those commandments. Verse 8. So that they, then they that are in the flesh cannot please Jah. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of Jah dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of the Messiah, he is none of his. Galatians 5. This I say then. Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So you see that? Blessed are the poor in the spirit. Blessed is the poor man who worships the most high in spirit. Blessed are those who worship the most high in spirit. Blessed are those that worship him in spirit. Yeah, I'm hammering it, hammering it. This needs to be put into play so you don't have to strive for riches and you don't also have to make yourself poor. Just put your best efforts in Jah and he will guide you in all the other things that you need. No matter how old you are, you'll get there. Don't worry. And if you don't want to do that, then you can serve riches. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Don't forget them. Never forget them. Matthew 6, 
Lay not up for yourselves treasures. Let me say that again, sorry. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust do corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. So look what the Messiah is saying here. The Messiah is letting us know that, hey man, don't bother collect treasures. Don't bother thinking, you know, all the things you want to get and collect in life and and these things that are valuable to people and human beings. Don't lay up treasures for yourself upon earth where moth, rust, where thieves can break through. You know, all those carnal material stuff. This is what he's talking about. He's making a distinction between material things and, and spiritual things. <clears throat> Continuing. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doeth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So spiritual treasures, and what are they? Obedience, love, faith, kindness, gratitude, and all charity, all those things that are called the fruits of the spirit. These are the things that you wanna do, that you're gonna be laying up. Self-sacrifice, you know, sometimes not going to every function in the world that says, hey, let's let's party, let's get it going. <laughs> you know? We're doing too much of that. I did a lot of that in my life too. And, you know, things got to change a bit as you get older. And for young people, if you cannot get caught up in that now, man, you, you'll save yourself a lot of heartache that you're going to get from meeting up with a lot of other things in the world that are not moving in the right direction. Let's continue. For where your treasure is, there will your heart or your mind be also. You ever heard the saying, you know, got money on my mind, is on my mind is on money, right? So that's what it's saying here. Where your treasure is, that's where your mind is gonna be. If you're focusing on material wealth, and that's your savior, if you get all this money, people will respect you and they'll know that you're successful and you'll show them and and all of that, and they'll think that, yeah, you know, you have some wisdom, that's where your mind is gonna be. And that means that if your mind is on your money and on your wealth, and if your mind is on yourself all the time, then how can you love him with all your mind, right? He's going to be like, you're going to love him with a little bit of your mind, whatever's left over from the love that you're giving mammon and the riches and self. Do not put anything else in front of the love of the Most High. You know what the scripture says, the Messiah says it. Mother, father, children, life itself, even your own life. If you don't even put your life second to him, you're not worthy of being a disciple. Can you do that? Can I do that? May the Most High give us strength and have mercy on us as we try to live up to these high, high callings of the Most High. Let's continue. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be good or single, the whole body shall be full of light. So, you know, what you see through your eyes, you know it can corrupt you. And you know that, you know, if you're looking for good things in life and you're using your eyes for a good way, that's good. But here's letting us know that, hey, you got to start watching your eyes because it's your eyes that want the treasures, right? Your eyes that want the lust stuff of that person. Or you see the new thing that just came out over there or the new this and that. Your eyes like that car. It likes that house. It, it wants these things. Again, separate between the need and the want. That's what I want you to do. So again, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be good or righteous, upright, then your whole body, the way you live, is going to be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? That's a great darkness, everyone. If you have an evil eye, as they say, that means you're bad-minded. And then at the same time, you pray, you read a Bible, you go to church, but you have an evil eye towards other people and towards those who are seeking righteousness and you're envious and you're jealous of them and you gossip and you backbite and you hate secretly. Well, you should know what you get, you get and I, or I should get what we deserve, right? Verse 24, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve Jah and riches. Or it says in the King James, you cannot serve Jah and Mammon. Mammon. You can't do it. 
I know people try to, you know, they try to multitask it. <laughs> they say that, hey, you know, I'll serve a little bit of the world, pursue it, and still serve Ja. Nah, the most you're going to come to is just be religious. Yeah, you'll, you know, you'll read your Bible and go to church and maybe have some pretty good social, religious friends and stuff like that. But guess what? You're not going to get eternal life. You can't get it because, you know, your, your heart or your mind is in one area or the not, in the other. Just think about it. If you're really pursuing something in life and you're putting all your efforts into it, then you're going to do everything. And then whatever is secondary, you know, you're going to give it secondary. So here it's saying if, you know, if you love riches, and remember, it's the love of money, not money itself. The love of money is the root of all evil. Verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat and what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than raiment? And we read this sometimes and we're like, well, what does the most I say? Oh, don't go shopping, don't care. No, don't have these things be the whole care of your life. You're just living just so you can shop and buy food and eat nice food and go buy clothes and material things you know life is more important than these things right what's your choice what are you going to serve you, you got to choose and listen if you serve want to serve mammon and riches you can go do it you probably be get some good money you might become famous you, know, you might even be able to help others find success in their life and and, and put themselves together as well but you know where i'm going with this you're going to get e eternal death because you didn't want to follow the Most High. You chose this path. See, you probably have in your mind, and I had in my mind too, like, what's going on? How do you balance off this thing? And the way I see it is you work to survive. You spend your money on the things you need to. And I, I'm just learning about that. I still sometimes think I buy things I don't really need, but I want. But it all depends how you grow, right? But you have to learn that, hey, sometimes it's even better to save money than spend it. So you got to be wise with your money, but at the same time, don't have that be the whole end all of what you, you know, your life. And even if you are poor right now and you think if, hey, if I win the lottery and, and get millions, you know, that's just going to make my situation better. I'm going to love the most high and serve him better. I'm even going to travel the world. I'll, I'll even build him a church and or a building of, of worship and all these things. That's OK. You can think that, right? But that's where your mind might be. You might think that you need the money to get those things going. When, and when the Most High needs a building or whatever he needs to help the poor, he's got people there to do it. So don't be like a poor person who's just going to hope and worship money. Because you can serve and worship money even if you don't have that much of it. That means to you, money's your God. Money's your savior. If you get the money, you're going to make it. It's a trap. Scripture, Matthew 6. Behold, the birds of the air, for they sow not, they don't plant, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? That's right. Think about it. You see the birds all the time. Don't take nothing for, like, for granted in the natural world, right? The natural world, is a display of who Jah is. And you see the birds fly down to the grass and they just start eating things off the grass. So a big flock, the Most High is feeding them. They know where to go. He takes care of them. He's looking after all of his creation. So it's saying here though, he loves you know his, his creation, but he loves man too. And he's saying, aren't you better than them? And remember, this is in the same, this is going back, Continuing from Matthew chapter 6 here. We're just continuing reading. Continue. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for clothes or raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yeah, they don't make their own clothes. They don't sew or make their own clothes. They don't go shopping for it. But they have beautiful, beautiful colors. Not just lilies, all of the flowers. Consider the flowers is what the Most High is saying here. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed 
or dressed or decorated like one of these. You see, the Most High puts a lot of decoration into his creation and into his natural world. But when we think that, you know, with all our fine clothes, and we're talking about Solomon here, the wisest, the richest um, at that time. You think he can dress? <laughs> Boy, I bet you he, he had, if he had wisdom, he had, had it all. He had the finest of all the clothes. And the Messiah here is, is using him as a comparison. He's not talking bad about Solomon, but he's just saying, you who are a common person, you know, you're striving to get all these clothes and look nice and fresh. Yeah, that's okay. Well, let's think about Solomon. He was fresh. He looked good. But he wasn't even decorated like, like the plants, even like the birds, anything in creation. It goes on to say, Wherefore, if just so clothes, clothes the grass of the field, which, is to, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith, O ye of little faith. Again, this is in that area here. If we have faith in the Most High, we're supposed to trust Him. Lean on Him. Trust Him. That means seek Him first and trust Him that He's going to give you all this other stuff. He do it today. What does that mean? Repent. Start reading. Start studying. Praying. Live good. Clean out your house. You have any idols in your house? Take it out. Do you have any idols in your life? Take it out. Do your best. Verse 31. Therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or with, wherewith shall we be clothed? And when it says here, take no thought, I actually, you know, looked into other translations and everything. It doesn't mean don't think about it. It just means don't let these things pressure you. Don't be pressured wondering what you're going to eat and be under stress. You know, where am I going to, you know, get my clothes from? That's what it means. Don't take no bad thoughts and pressures about it. For all these things do the Gentiles, the heathens, or the nations. This is what they seek. This is what the world seeks. Those that are not seeking the Most High. For your Heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. So again, do you trust Him that He knows? Are you willing to give up those fruitless pr prayers that say, Help me, I need money. Give me some money. Pay my rent, my mortgage. My phone bill is due. Where's my groceries at? He says right here, he knows you need it. So that's a test of faith on your half. And, I, and, and I'm stepping up to this challenge as well. I hope you can too. Verse 33 is where the message hits home. But seek ye first, make this the prime effort in life, the kingdom of Jah and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. That's right. And I made that decision in my life many, many, many years ago. <laughs> Even though it's not that many in terms of many. But more than 25 years ago, I made that decision myself to seek him first. And I'm glad I have a roof over my head. I'm not wealthy, but I'm not poor that I have to teeth. Jazz provided things for me just to survive enough. And if there's a little bit more, that's fine. That means if he gives me a little bit more, I got to give him a little bit more. Because usually when you have a lot of money, a lot of stuff, you usually have a lot of time, free time. And I always like to challenge people to say, hey, whatever you do in your free time the most, that's what you really love. Because you, you have to go to work, you come home, you, gotta, you got chores, you got to live, you got to clean. If you have family, you, you're doing all those things. But then when you do get that free time, is it just spent watching hours of TV programs or searching through endless videos of YouTube, you know, that are really not even profitable for you you just go shopping around you just use all your free time yeah you just want to travel what, what's what's you know what's with you in your free time and that'll tell you what you love and i would encourage you to try to use a lot of that time as much as you can to seek the most high in whichever way that he leads you in in, in your life thirty four take therefore no thought for the morrow for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. That's right. Don't worry about where things are going to come tomorrow. The scripture is telling you, like, you know, you got problems and evil and, and things to deal with right now and hardships. So take each day as it is. You know, we say it all the time. You know, we live, we're living day by day. But living day by day, 
obviously we were alive every day, but it's a mentality, right? Living day by day is a mentality, knowing that in this one day, you're gonna try to complete all the things you can in a proper way to the most high and to look after yourself. And then you're gonna make plans, small plans for that next day. When that next day comes, you're doing it, but you're not overlooking things and, you know, making all these type of plans of doing all these other things and not really focusing on how you're living day to day. It will come. <laughs> Scriptures here, Matthew 10. And Joshua looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of Jah? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Joshua answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of Jah. You see what he's saying here? How hardly? And then they were like, they couldn't believe it. What do you mean? Everybody's living to try to get stuff to, to survive and, you know, and live. And they were marveling at it, it says. You know, it says uh, they were astonished at his words. But then he goes on to say in verse 24, trusting in the riches. People have a security blanket in their money. Yeah, the security blanket is, you know, gives them confidence. They feel okay. You know, they're not worried about a lot of things that many people who don't have money are thinking about. The roof over their head, where their meal is coming from, and all of those things. But if you trust in your riches as some type of security, because, you know, if you needed to get any type of medical care, you can do it. If you needed to buy anything that you needed at all or wanted, whatever it was, you know, you trust in your riches to get you that to get to get you by. But listen to what the Messiah is saying here. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of Jah. Now you know how small a needle is, right? Like a little small little thing. And a camel's a big thing. And he's just trying to show you it's almost impossible. Because you can't squeeze a can you squeeze a camel into a needle? No, we can't do it. But think about it. If the Most High is powerful and he could do, we say he could do anything. Could he squeeze a camel through uh, the eye of a needle? Sure it can. It wouldn't even be so hard. And Joshua, looking upon them, saith, with men, it is impossible to camel through the needle thing, but not with Jah. For with Jah, all things are possible. So yeah, you can say, well, Abraham was rich. The kings of Israel were rich. Noah and all those guys probably had wealth and yeah, it's possible with them. But those guys never loved, you know, their wealth more than the Most High. And these, those guys probably weren't even wealthy then. And then the Most High, like with Abraham, the Most High made him wealthy. So don't try to find some excuses in Scripture to say, this is why I want to be wealthy. Because these other guys were wealthy. <clears throat> then Peter began to say unto him, here's a good message here. Lo, look. We have left all and have followed thee, have followed you. And Joshua answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold. Now, in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions <laughs> and in the world to come eternal life so you see here they left everything and they left it but they're going to get eternal life but they might have all these things you know they left all of their lands or whatever it is but you know that the apostles were persecuted so again you can leave all your stuff for the most high you be persecuted, and then you might get some things like he says right here. It says, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. But when you get these things, you might get them with persecutions. But in the world to come, eternal life. Again, blessed are the poor in spirit. Mark 12. Joshua sat over against the treasury and beheld how people cast money into the treasury and many that were rich 
cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. She threw in a quarter, let's say, <laughs> not even. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. She put more into the treasury than everybody else did. <laughs> wow. You see what's going on here? But it only says she cast in two mites. How can that possibly be more? Because this is what the Most High is talking about when it comes to riches and helping the poor and money and all this and that. Let's go on. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want or poverty did cast in all that she had, even all her living. And this word here, this word here, want, does translate into a word that means extreme poverty, everyone. Extreme. <sighs> Gotta grab, grasp these things for a second, you know? We read and we don't internalize the, the, the value, what's happening here. Luke 21. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, of a truth, I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast into the offerings of Jah. But she of her penury, that means extreme poverty, hath cast in all the living that she had. Oh, oh praise Jah. It's a, it's a teaching. She cast in more than everybody. It's amazing how the Most High works, eh? It's when you think, you know, He works of how, how we think. He just turns it around. She's really giving. And look at that. She's casting in for the temple. poor widow all that she has that's something you know just think about your life and see how this can apply in your life and whatever you might have to do I don't want to inundate you overwhelm you try to tell you what to do may the spirit guide you and how you're supposed to live and view this topic for the love of money is the root of of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. First Timothy 6. So a lot of people talk about this. Again, the focus is the love of money, trusting in riches, where your heart is or where your mind is, is where your treasure is. And it lets you know that people coveted after these things. They made that their prime goal in life. And look what happens. It says that they err in the faith or from the faith. <laughs> and they're pierced through with many sorrows. You see that? So don't think your pursuing of wealth and riches is going to be coming to you nice and easy as well. Because these many sorrows that are going to come to you are going to be in the end, in the judgment. This is how the Most High talks to us. So don't love money. Don't love nothing else. Love the Most High. Again, if you love something, you're going to do that thing the most.